it is 605. So why don't we go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Heather Bobrowitz. I am the programming librarian here with STC Library. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you to our guest speaker, William Roper. Um, and I had an introduction kind of started for him, but I also got to get a sneak peek at his uh, presentation and he's going to tell you about himself. And I think he's like more of an author authority on that than me. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go ahead and hand it on over to him. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, other, uh, Professor Garza, thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate everybody showing up as well. Uh, let me go ahead and get this uh, screen share going. And then I can get myself into presentation mode here. So, uh, so hey everybody, my name is William Roper and today we're going to be talking about technical project management. Uh, it is a loaded term and uh, I'm going to go ahead and basically dive into, you know, what we're going to be covering and things along those lines. Um, first and foremost, uh, safe harbor statement here. Um, my thoughts are my own. They are not uh, representative of the companies that I work for, the companies I have worked for, or anything like that. Uh, so before I run my mouth and let you all know all the dirt, you know, all the deep, dark, dirty secrets about technical project management, this is all me. This is all coming from me, and it has no reflection upon anybody that I work for or work with. So uh, my name is William. Very nice to meet everybody. Appreciate y'all stopping by. Uh, I graduated from STCC back in 2010. So yes, I am that old. Uh, I'm 33 right now. Uh, been in the IT industry for 17 years. Uh, I was actually one of the lucky folks that went to McAllen High School and uh, was able to get an A-plus certification when I was a junior there. Uh, so I've been uh, working with PCs, been working with desktops, been working with network administration and things like that for a very long time. Uh, I've basically had almost every kind of IT job under the sun. I've done everything from pull cables through attics, walls, and trench fiber lines to desk side IT support and things like that. Uh, when I finally left the Valley back in 2012, I moved to Austin and started work at HP Cloud. Uh, we were one of the first 20 employees there. Uh, after that, I moved to uh, global product management of Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Trials at Oracle. Uh, and then I had my brief stint as a technical project manager for Burlasoft, and that is a very large uh, managed service provider company headquartered out of Pune, India. And then after that, I've actually found my way back to Oracle, and I'm now a senior technical consultant for North American Alliances and Channels. Uh, and if you all have any questions about those titles and what I did back then, please feel free to hit me up after this. So presentation overview. Uh, we're going to be talking about what exactly technical project management is. I'm going to be covering, you know, kind of a day in the life of project planning, what you need to do, how you need to get through it. I'm going to be talking about project management itself, um, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, on a week-to-week -week basis. And I've kind of grouped that into what you do at the beginning of the project, what you do throughout the project, and how you wrap the project up. And then I'm going to be talking about the technical tasks that were kind of involved about what I did with uh, Burlasoft and everybody else there. At, um... So... <sighs> What is a technical project manager? There's, it's really hard to define this without using the words in the definition, so I'm very sorry about that. But essentially, you are a technical subject matter expert. Uh, you're usually scoped towards uh, a major facet of that project. So in my point, uh, I was I'm a subject matter expert for Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. I, uh, hold a, I hold about three or four different certifications for OCI. Uh, and basically, the reason why I was brought on to manage this project was because I had that technical acumen. And um, funny thing about it is that when I interviewed, they basically asked me, William, can you be an adult? And that's really what project management is, being an adult about the, what you're doing with, about what you're working with. Uh, you need to manage and maintain a lot of folks. You need to keep people in the know. You need to deliver updates. You need to make sure things stay on track. Uh, and that's basically the gist of a technical project manager. You are an individual that knows everything about the project you're working on, both from a project standpoint and from a technical standpoint. So project planning is a pretty large undertaking. Uh, you have to do uh, basically everything to get this project off the ground. And by that, uh, you have to establish project scope. So project scope is essentially what you're going to be doing throughout this project. Uh, it is everything from we're going to be standing up infrastructure, we're going, to be in, we're going to be standing up VMs, we're going to be installing this package of software, we're going to be 
poking these holes in the firewall, all this stuff. That all is included in the scope. Essentially, the scope is what is going to be done during the project. Uh, you'll hear a lot of terms when you're in this environment called scope creep. And scope creep is essentially where you had plans to do specific technical work, but now you're kind of being forked off to do something else or to add something to the project or something along those lines. And that's what we kind of want to avoid. You always want to avoid scope creep. So basically, if it's not in scope, it shouldn't get done. It shouldn't be on your list. You shouldn't be tasking people to do that job. Uh, a really big part is establishing a list of stakeholders. So when people think IT, they think that they're going to be working with network administrators and they're going to think they're only going to be working with the people that hands-on keyboard only do that work. When you move to a technical project management role, you're working with a lot of other facets within the actual business itself. So a list of stakeholders could be anybody from IT engineering, could be anybody from the network administration team at that company. It could be marketing. Say you're developing a new product. Say you're pushing something to a new cloud provider. Marketing has to be aware of stuff like that. It could be the actual product managers themselves. So the people that are in charge of, you know, how this is supposed to behave, all the marketing around that piece. And also people like finance. You know, you want to make sure that whatever you're building is not going to break the bank. So you have to keep a lot of folks in the know when you're doing project management. So it's everybody from the tech side of the house to the bean counter side of the house. There's a lot of folks that have to be in the aware of a, have to be aware and in the know of a project when it comes time. Project flow is another concept that you have to establish. Essentially, it's like milestones, if you will. So you have to sit here with all of these technical individuals. You have to sit here with all the finance people, with all the marketing people, and you say, hey, well, we need to build X, Y, and Z before we can move to A, B, and C or vice versa. So in this case, um, it would be like building out the networking infrastructure, building out all of that stuff and getting all the interconnects, the fast connects, uh, the direct connects and stuff like that hooked up to a data center or however you plan to manage this environment. And then actually building VMs, getting the application up and running, getting QA involved for quality testing and regression testing and things like that. And then getting marketing involved saying, hey, this is a new product set coming. Uh, and then getting product management involved to set go live dates and things like that for this project. So it's all about establishing a flow of events that all have to take place at a certain time to unlock the next milestone. Uh, along with that, you also have to establish task ownership. So yes, I was the technical project manager. I did have a lot of tasks that belonged to me, but there were a lot of other pieces and parts that I didn't have control of. So case in point, when I was working on my project, there were actually two IT verticals or two IT business units within the company. There was a commercial infrastructure side of the house, and then there was the corporate networking side of the house. So I worked specifically on the commercial infrastructure side because we were building out a new cloud environment. However, I needed to get all of those machines talking to the corporate network. I didn't have access to that. I had to deal with other people to actually bring that on board to get those fiber lines ran, to get all those things terminated, to get the communication flowing essentially. So there's a lot of task ownership that has to go, and you have to hold people accountable to that. So that kind of flows into project timeline. So now that you've established what the scope is, you've established who needs to be involved, you've established the flow of the project, and you've established a task ownership, you then kind of have to pivot to, all right, how long is this going to take? Uh, I think we kicked off our project in December, and we were done by April 21st. So, you know, it's a matter of sitting everybody down in a room and getting a real world expectation of, hey, we know you have a day to day job that you have to do, but we also need you to do this extra piece. How long is this going to take? How much free time do you have throughout the week? How much time can you dedicate to this piece right here? And that kind of goes into people giving you timelines around, hey, well, this is going to take two weeks. This is going to take a month. This is going to take three weeks, so on and so forth. So there's a lot that goes into that piece. And the best thing you can do as a project manager is pad that time. <laughs> if somebody tells you it's going to take two weeks, you're going to report back, oh, it's going to take them a month. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, going to, that they're going to get that entire month, but you got to have wiggle room built into this project so that if something comes up, if there is a huge network outage and you know, we have to take people off of working on the project to go solve a real world paying customer problem, then that's what we have to do. 
It's essentially, you have to, you have to basically have that wiggle room within the project so that if something does slip, you're not affecting the overall go live date. You're just affecting, you know, this person had two weeks to do it. They need additional week. We're taking this away from somebody else kind of thing. It's, a, it's an ebb and flow. It's kind of a take and give situation there. So project management itself, there's a lot of things you got to do. There's a lot of things you got to take care of. Um, really what you want to do is you want to take that flow that you established in the project plan. You want to take those stakeholders that you have. You want to take those task owners. And you want to break that out into milestones within a ticketing system like Jira. So uh, Jira is a company owned by Atlassian. They have a million other components out there. Uh, they own HipChat, they own Confluence, they own a bunch of stuff. Uh, but I focus within Jira and Confluence. And essentially what we do here is you use a ticketing system like Jira so you can create epics for every single milestone, which is a very 10,000 foot overview of a specific task. So the epic would be create network infrastructure. And then that subtask, that story below that, would be something a bit more refined. So it would be create networks for production, create networks for QA, create networks for development and testing. And then subtasks beneath all of those would be create public subnets here, create private subnets there, so on and so forth. Use these IP addresses, use this slash, slash 16 here, use a slash eight there, use a slash 16 there. Really, it's a cascading effect that allows you to track the progress of every single task that needs to be done. Uh, and with that, document everything. Nothing is too small to document. You, I, when I was building out these tickets and I was getting information back, I was going as far as to document what the OCID was of every single subnet, what the subnet count was, like how big it was, you know, whether we needed a slash 24 here, a slash 25 there, so on and so forth. You need to make sure that it's a very comprehensive document. And that's kind of your role as a project manager. You are, you are gathering all this information, you're putting it inside of a ticket, and you're making sure that it is available to whoever needs it. Now, once you have all of those tickets and everything assigned, once you have all those tickets and everything built, is when you start doing these daily standup meetings. So daily standup meetings for me usually included the technical teams. I didn't have folks from finance. I didn't have folks from marketing or any of those folks on there. It was more along the lines of me looking at the people who were hands-on keyboard and saying, what are you doing today? What are you doing today? How long is that going to take? Get back to me by end of business. If we're here, there, or anywhere else, we need to make an adjustment in the timeline. And that usually takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Um, really, it's just about getting aligned. It's about making sure everybody has their goals for the day, their goals for the week, and making sure that there aren't any blockers. You know, there isn't anything pre from preventing them from doing their work. Now, the call that I took, the call that took place every single week was the weekly Tiger Team call. It's not, it's not a technical term. Uh, you can insert any big cat if you want there. I mean, we could have a weekly Panther Team call, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but the Tiger team call was that bigger group of stakeholders. So I took all of my progress that we had in Jira, kind of boiled that down to a percentage bar. So, hey, the project is 100%. We are currently at 30% and kind of gave them an idea of what we did during the week, what's up next, what's blocking us, what's slipping. And that's where you get a lot of additional that's, that's where a lot of the hard questions get answered because the Tiger team call consists of people that are non-technical as well. So there, there's going to be a lot of uh, translation, if you will, that you have to make for these people so that they can understand where the project sits. Um, <laughs> it's a difficult call, but it's a fun call because usually when you're delivering great news, everybody's very happy about it. Usually when you're delivering bad news, a project slipping, we are now behind by two and a half weeks you then get calls from everybody's boss. So uh, keep it simple, keep it, keep it short, and just let them know what the actions are and what we're doing about it. So during the project, you always are gonna be keeping track of tasks in Jira. And then once you're at a point where you've actually stood the infrastructure up, you've stood up the application services, that's when you gotta start involving other people as well. So we've talked about having to have finance, having infrastructure, having uh, corporate networking, having all these other folks on there, but we haven't talked about QA. So QA would be engaged at this point, and we have to basically have an environment for them that they can do stuff like regression and performance testing. So for those of you that don't know, regression testing is essentially a functionality test. 
Uh, when you deploy an application in a new environment, you want to make sure that the button that you click does the same exact action as it does when it's on-premise, as it does when it's in AWS, as it does when it's in Azure. And that's what regression testing is. Essentially, it's a, we use robot scripting with uh, Python to run through and basically hammer the application stack with all these commands and everything came back with a thumbs up or something was broken and we needed to bring that back and adjust some parameters within you know, uh, the application configuration. Performance testing is a whole different beast. Uh, performance testing included things like how, you know, not only does that button work, but how fast does it return what I asked it for? Uh, that is a very, that's a very, uh, I guess, I guess it's a, it's a really robust test because there are a lot of variables that can come out of that. Regretfully, when you're doing performance testing, not everything's always going to be the same. So for some reason, if you have a different type of storage attached to your instances that has more IOPS or more bandwidth or throughput to it, you have to basically figure out, well, why does it work this way at AWS? And why does it work this way over at OCI or vice versa? Like, why does it perform so much better over here and not over there? And then out of that comes a lot of reporting, becomes a lot of explaining. Uh, essentially, it just boils down to how well does it work and does it pass the minimum benchmark? Uh, we still keep on with the daily stand-up meetings. It's a 10 to 15 minute call every morning. Still do the same thing every single day. And we still have the weekly Tiger team calls. And these, after the regression testing and the performance testing metrics and things like that come out, that's where the Tiger team calls get really interesting because the guys who are marketing want to sit down and say, well, does it run 30% better over here? And how much does it cost now if we're getting this performance? What's our trade-off? What's this? What's that? So there's a lot of questions that go on there that you have to account for. Now, Wrapping up the project, you're still going to be doing all the daily tasks. You want to make sure that you've closed out all these epics. You've had, you've had, you know, X amount of weeks, months, or maybe even a year to wrap up all the subtasks, to get through all the blockers, to wrap up all these stories, to wrap up all the milestones and epics. You want to make sure that that progress bar that we were talking about earlier, it's 100%. You know, we're, we're done. Now, what happens when you're done? You need to establish a change or a code freeze in this point. So once we've hit a point where we are ready to go GA, which is generally available with a project, it is hands off keyboard now. We've built what we've needed to build. We've configured what we've needed to configure. We have now a working viable product. And we need to make sure that no one else goes in there and messes with it. <laughs> so we establish a date, a hard stop saying, you know, if our project ends on the 21st, no one's touching a thing after the 18th. It's going to sit there for the next few days. We're going to onboard some customers and we're going to see how it goes. You get to get final runs from QA. We're going to let them come in and say, all right, run your test. Is everything still passed now that we're done? We've not, we're not touching anything else. We've made no more configuration changes. Does everything still work? If you get the all clear from QA, that's when you start wrapping up this project. So you essentially deliver a very long progress report, a very long long meeting <laughs> that basically says, this is what we did. This is how long it took. This is how much it costs. This is how much is basically costing per day per customer. There's a lot of math that has to go into that. And you, you just tell that entire story of the project to everybody on to all of the stakeholders on that call. Uh, and, and yes, like you, you cover absolutely everything from technical overviews to QA results, cost analysis, and everything else like that we mentioned. Um, thankfully, uh, the project that we were working on, we came in under budget and we came in under budget per customer. So they were guesstimating that it was going to be about something to the tune of around $7,000 a year to run a single customer. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, we came in at around $5,500 per individual customer. So um, we were able to come in under budget, which is usually unheard of in the IT industry, but uh, it, it went really well. So I've talked to you all about this project stuff, um, all of the tasks, roles, responsibilities, everything you're going to have to have and everything you, you have to deal with and have to put up with as a project manager. Uh, what did I do as a technical project manager? You know, what was the tech side of the house, you know? And I was responsible for quite a bit. So being that I was the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure subject matter expert at this project, Every single piece of OCI core infrastructure and networking pieces was built by me personally. So I had my own tasks, I had my own epics, I had my own stories and they were assigned to me. And essentially 
it all started at the beginning by doing technical architecture. So we sat down in a room with all of the IT heads and we said, how do we want to build this? How many IP addresses can I have per subnet? How are we going to set up these fast connects? What kind of latency are we going to expect moving from OCI to your data center, out to AWS, so on and so forth? How do we want to make sure that everybody can phone home and still talk to each other? Because this is just one large cohesive application. It's going to be a multi-cloud, a hybrid environment. So we worked through all of that. We had a very large diagram built out and basically said, this is how everything's going to be built. And I actually just started chipping away at that. So I did everything from standing up the fast connect infrastructure. Uh, we hooked up to an uh, Ashburn data center at Equinix using a border gateway protocol. Uh, after that, we established a kind of a hub and spoke style uh, transit networking model where we have a network that essentially terminates all those fast connect connections. And then we spoke that connectivity out to the data center from that singular VCN. So we were able to take a lot of subnet creation, a lot of security list port configuration. I was setting up uh, doing local peering gateways so that networks and other, for and other places could talk to each other, so on and so forth. Uh, I did everything from instance creation to creating backup plans. Um, the instance creation is not as hard as you all think it may be. Uh, really what I did was I just took a look at what they were running inside of AWS and said, okay, so you have four vCPUs, you have 32 gigs of RAM, so we need two OCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM over at Oracle, so on. You know, it was a pretty easy process, but it's just a matter of standing all of that up. Uh, I worked with all the technical delivery teams. So it was the folks that were hands on keyboard. I had to make sure they all had access to the environment, both from a OCI console perspective and from a VM access. So I'm sitting here sending people IP addresses said, hey, this is your box now. Here's your one time generated password, log in, change it, go to work. Uh, and also in charge of training this team. So me being the subject matter expert, I had to sit down with the people that were going to be managing and maintaining this environment after I left and said, this is how it runs. This is what we built. And this is how you're going to fix it when it does X, Y, or Z. And that all kind of culminated into documentation. So this is the least favorite technical part of any IT job is documentation. There are folks that are really good at writing IT technical documentation. And then there are people like me that aren't. <laughs> so uh, really what I did was you, you, you pull a lot of the information out of JIRA into Confluence. You create runbooks. You create documentation around this is how every single network was built for production. This is how every single network was built for development and testing. This is how every single network was built for staging. Uh, you, you create runbooks, which essentially said, hey, if backups fail, you need to check this. If a VM fails to start, you need to check this. Or you know, so on and so forth. And it's really a matter of establishing whose problem it is. What happens when something breaks? Is this an our problem? Do we need to fix this? Is this a problem with the application? Is this a problem with something that we can fix? Or is this a cloud provider problem? You know, are, are, are my backups failing because of an account issue? Are my backups failing because of a networking problem, which would in turn mean that you have to create a support request with Oracle or whomever else that you're working with. And at the end of the day, being a technical project manager is everything from technical responsibilities, project responsibilities, and kind of marrying those two together and basically running interference between technical individuals that are actually hands on keyboard working on the project and non-technical individuals that have a stakehold in this project as well. And I kind of blew through that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that was, uh, let me see. We'll, we'll, give me a clock here. What am I at? All right. I'm at 629. Okay. So I got through that in about 25 minutes. Um, I glossed over a lot. Uh, so I, I see there's quite a bit in Q and a and a lot of chat. So more than happy to sit down and talk with you all. Um, let's, let's take a look here. Oh, boy. All right. Okay. Double paycheck. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily a double paycheck, Mr. Garza. Uh, everything was kind of wrapped up into one, but essentially, yeah. Uh, have we ever made a mistake? Um, that's, that's a loaded question. Uh, on this project, uh, thankfully, everything went pretty smoothly. Um, there wasn't a... There wasn't a huge expense or a huge cost or anything like that that kind of messed everything up. Uh, we did have 
uh, quite a bit of slip in the project timeline, getting those fast connect environments stood up because of those two segregated IT environments. So I had everything set up correctly at Oracle, and it was just a matter of me waiting on another individual from another department to get the fiber lines ran, to get the converter set up, and to actually make that fiber termination. And that, that kind of pushed our project back a little bit, about, about a month or so. So I was, around, I was about four weeks behind getting that piece stood up because, you know, I guess we just weren't working as a team as well as we should have. And what happens if that doesn't work? Mario, I'm going to need you to be a little more specific. You said at 629, um, what was the biggest hurdle you've had to overcome to get where you, might, to get where you are? Oh, all right. So let's see here. I'm 33 years old and I have an associate's in computer, an electronic and computer maintenance I got from STC. So I think the biggest hurdle was getting my foot in the door with HP Cloud. Uh, that required me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I've gotten the majority of my jobs from recommendations of other individuals in the IT industry. So I got recommended for HP Cloud by a former student here at STC named Michael Murphy. Uh, I knew three of the other individuals that he had on that team. We all kind of got stacked up. Uh, so when he put my name in the hat, I got the phone call. I drove up to Austin. I, <laughs> I drove up at... Let's see. No, I spent the night there. So I actually, I actually drove the day before, got a hotel, drove over to the data center and did my interview that day uh, and drove back home and did some contract negotiations with them. But that's, that was one of the biggest hurdles was just getting my foot in the door. But the thing was, is that the, the thing was, is that I, I had the wherewithal, I had the knowledge. It was a matter of making sure that the people that were in larger IT industries knew that I was a viable candidate. So that, that was probably one of the biggest things. Yeah, hands down, is just getting your foot in the door. Uh, because, you know, like I said, uh, oh. <laughs> so what skill sets are needed? What certifications to start in these kind of directions? Uh, so um, I, had, I, had a, I had a really good opportunity at STC when I did the electronic and computer maintenance because it basically got me to a point where I knew how to troubleshoot problems on the fly. And that's what was kind of required in that initial job that I had where I was like desk side IT support. You know, I'd sit down and say, all right, well, what's the problem? You know, have you rebooted it? Okay, you did. All right, well, let's find out why I can't print the PDF. You know, <laughs> that was the majority of the problems that I had there at desk side IT. But I was able to take that a step further because when you start problem solving regularly, you can start helping people quicker. You have a better idea of all of the variables that could be out there saying like, hey, well, I can't connect to the internet. It's like, all right, well, you know, let's check the cheapest thing first. You know, how, how, what, what's your cable look like? Uh, you, do you have, you know, is it the correct NIC in your, in your PC that you have running? Right, now let's check the switch. Okay, well, let's, let's just restart everything. Let's see if everything comes up. You know, it's a matter of sitting there and getting the experience that you need to kind of think on the fly and kind of solution on the fly. Uh, very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Gross. Appreciate that. How many women have I seen in my workplace? All right. Uh, let's see, we had one, two, three. So I work in Austin. So it's, it's a pretty diverse crowd up here. It's um, everybody from, um, you know, cis males, females, uh, openly homosexual individuals that I've worked with. Um, they're all great. And I understand the intimidation there. Uh, I think at the end of the day, a lot of that, a lot of the gender norms and the gender roles and stuff like that go right out the window. Because if you know how to fix a problem, you're invaluable. If you know how to do your job really well, it doesn't matter what you identify as or what you actually are. It is very helpful to make sure that you prove yourself on a technical acumen. Um, I've worked with, uh, I've worked with about seven women on the tech side of the house. Uh, they're great. They did, they did a fantastic job. You know, we all worked in great collaboration. There was no animosity. There was no, I'm better than you. You're better than me. Anything like that. Um, it was just, you know, as long as you were able to show up and perform and do your response, do your roles and your responsibilities, a lot of that went out the way. Yeah. Do you need to have good communication skills? So that really depends on the role. 
So when I was working L1, L2 chat uh, for uh, HP Cloud, communication skills, you know, it, it was very seldom that I got a phone call. You know, I could chat all day long and chat support. I could copy and paste links. I could say, hey, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Um, the other roles that I had being like the outbound technical project, being the outbound uh, product manager for OCI trials, that required massive amounts of communication skills because I had to go to Dublin, Ireland and meet with the trials team for EMEA and make sure that they had all the proper training and, the, and all of the wherewithal they needed to start running OCI trials in EMEA. I had to go to Singapore. I had to go to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I had to sit down with the teams over there in the APAC regions to make sure that they had all of the training and all the necessary components that they needed to start hosting OCI trials in our APAC regions as well. So I would say that you know it really depends on your role. If it's very customer facing, if you're going to be solutioning ideas with customers, if you're going to be training individuals, if you're going to be an evangelist, if you will, I see communications key. If you're going to be one of the individuals behind the curtain, you're going to be part of network operations, DC operations, you're going to be L1, L2 chat, things like that. I wouldn't say you need to have good public speaking skills, uh, but you know you do have to have some kind of you, know, you do have to have some kind of skills uh, and, and some kind of communication skills there. Um, yeah, critical thinking, absolutely, Mr. Garza is one of the best things you can have. How important is interpersonal communication in this field? Uh, huge, huge, yeah. Um, let me see here. Hold on. Let me, uh, sorry, I had to reset my screen there. Uh, interpersonal communication, like, you know, working with your team, it, it's, it's, it's key. It's, it's crucial. Um, you know, I, I came from a cloud environment in 2012, uh, working at HP cloud and then moved to, uh, Oracle in 2016. And my team was very diverse. I had a really interesting organization. Uh, me being, I think at the time I was 26, 27 years old, I was the youngest, I was one of the youngest individuals on my team. Um, and I was working with sales engineers and all these other folks that, you know, I've been an Oracle DBA since you were a third grader in, in elementary school, William, you know, things like that. But on the flip side of it, they've never touched cloud before. They don't necessarily know how things work in a virtualized environment. So having that interpersonal communication between, you know, this DBA over here, he can ask me for help. They'll say, hey, William, my database isn't performing the way it should. What do I need to do to these block volumes? And I'll say, oh, well, you need to go over here. You need to adjust this. You know, you need to uh, add uh, performance units to this volume so it, so it runs faster. Or I'll be sitting there saying like, you know, hey, Jeff, I don't know how to stand up this database. I don't know SQL. Can you help me? So really, it's very important to have interpersonal communication with the rest of your team members because those are the folks you rely on at the end of the day. Those are the folks that are going to get you out of sticky situations and vice versa. Would you recommend working a year or two for any IT job before going to a job like yours? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, you know, I got a lot of my, of my troubleshooting skills, uh, not just at STC, but also in that first job that I had where I was doing IT support. You know, I, I got dispatched out to uh, real estate companies. I got dispatched out to apartment complexes. Their Wi-Fi was down. This was not working. That was not working, so on and so forth. And it kind of forced me to grow, to think on my feet because, you know, when you, when you get called out to do a service call, you know, you're charging by the hour and that usually gets very expensive. It's a really large problem, but if it's something that can be fixed easily, you know, you show up, you fix a problem for somebody and you then all of a sudden become this trusted advisor, you know, so you, it gives you an opportunity to really grow with those people that you're working with. So working any kind of IT job, hundred percent, I absolutely, I would absolutely say go in there wreck shop <laughs> and just and try to find yourself uh, a corporate gig because there's a lot of there's a lot of give and take here in, in the corporate world you know there are some days that i am very very busy i have back-to-back -back meetings i have presentations i have to give this is actually my second one today uh and then there are other days where i'm just kind of like all right there's a new call of duty update let's go you know so getting into a position where you know you're salaried a lot of that stuff, it takes a lot of time to get there, but you have to develop and hone those skills to act and iterate on the fly when, it, when, when the time comes. And you do that by working like these IT jobs, by figuring things out the hard way. Absolutely. Do you think, do you have to have a business thinking approach? 
So, uh, not, I mean, it really depends on the role. Um, I would say that a business thinking approach probably would have benefited me a bit more when I was a sales engineer, because that not just requires you to have kind of a technical piece to it as well, where you're, you're making a grandiose solution for a project or for a problem. But at the same time, you have to think about money and how all that works. You have to know the total cost of ownership, the TCO of this environment. Uh, so having some kind of business acumen is really good to have. Um, being able to quantify how much a project costs and break that down by, well, this is how much it's going to be per month. This is how much it is per year. However, your total cost of ownership for everything, including backups, yada, 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 is going to cost X. So having a little bit of a business approach to that is a, is, is, is a very good skill to have. Absolutely. So you're a good example of what steps to follow as you see the shame. Hey, thank you. Oh, has COVID affected my job? Uh, actually, not really, no. <laughs> uh, thankfully, when I was at HP Cloud, um, I moved from a technical support role to a technical account management role where if you spent a quarter of a million dollars a quarter, you got my phone number and I fixed your problems. You didn't have to go to chat. You didn't have to cut a ticket and all that other stuff. And having a role and having a focused account set like that gave me a lot of flexibility to work from home basically whenever I wanted because I had one other coworker here in Austin. My manager was in California. My other coworkers were on the East Coast. There was no collaboration required for that position because I was the one that was picking up the phone. I was the one that was solving the problem. So I didn't need to be in the office. And it's kind of been, it's kind of been, you know, back and forth on that a little bit. You know, when I was in the sales engineering spot, I had to go into the office. I had to work with my sales reps. I had to work with the rest of my team. I was great, but I already knew how to work from home. I already knew how to, you know, if I email you and you don't pick and you don't respond back, I'm going to ping you on Slack or HipChat. If you don't respond back, I'm going to phone call you. If you don't call back, I'm going to call your boss and get somebody to help me. So, you know, I already had all these kind of levels of, you know, escalation that I would know about and that I would work through. So COVID really didn't affect my job that much, you know, because I have the headset. I got the fancy microphone. I, you know, this, I'm already ready to work from home. <laughs> Uh, Professor Garza asked a few questions in the QA. How many times have you been swamped logistical versus the physical project? Who it would seem that a project manager is just 24 seven. Yeah. So uh, project management is kind of a 24 seven role, kind of like what I alluded to earlier. If everybody knows what they're supposed to do and you can trust them, your job's kind of done for the day. Uh, however, if there is a fire that takes place and somebody has a problem and all of a sudden there's a bunch of blockers and William, uh, how does all of this work now? Or, hey, can you fix this problem over here? Hey, can you fix this problem over there? Or I'm not getting any response from this team over here that's supposed to give us our QA results. Can you run that down for me? So there's, there's a lot of that that goes, that goes on and it does kind of turn into a 24-7 job. Uh, however, you know, it just depends on which, you know, which, which hours of the day you want to work, you know, cause like I said, really the only meetings that I 100% had to attend and that I was 100% responsible for were the daily standup calls for 10 to 15 minutes and that weekly tiger team call, everything else I could either delegate out to somebody else. I could attend if necessary, or I could kind of, you know, <laughs> catch up on some uh, OCI training or, you know, work on a side project or something of that sort, better myself and sharpen my acumen, something like that. Um, now, as far as logistical versus physical project, uh, kind of touching back on that whole network debacle that I was talking about where I had everything set up over here and I was waiting on an additional team to, to wrap up the, the, the physical data center side of the house. That was one of the biggest problems that I had. And like that, that took us back a month. And it was everything from, oh, well, the fiber runs from this data center to the Oracle Cloud data center are too long. We need to get converters. And I need to rush order that. And I need to get my data center ops team to terminate these connections. And, 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 and. So the, the, it, it, was, it, was, it was a kind of a combination of both. It was, you know, getting pieces and parts and everything ordered and getting there on getting getting them there on time 
and then having somebody go in and actually make the physical fiber termination. So it it does it does happen. And a a done point really has multiple descriptions, correct? I'm not too sure I understand that secondary part there, Heather, of uh, Professor Garza's question. Anyways, someone like me, full-time college student, can make a resume more appealing to employers. Any certifications, programs? Okay, yeah. Oh, oh you, big time, big time. Um, if you can, you know, and it really depends on what you want to work with, and it depends on where you want to go. But uh, any kind of associate architect uh, certification goes leaps and bounds. It gets you through the door most of the time. So if you have, if you can put in, you know, the hashtag time in and get yourself a... AWS and Azure or an OCI architect associate or a, a, even a professional architect examination. And as you get that, you get that certification done. That should be top dead center on your technical resume. Absolutely. You know, and it really depends on like, you know, who you want to go work for. Um, usually um, when you're, you know, usually when you're cruising, you know, the job listings or whatever on a, a certain company you want to work for, whether it be, you know, Blizzard or EA or Oracle, HP Cloud, or anybody in that field, anybody at field, they'll have some kind of requirements there for you. Um, any kind of uh, CompTIA as well. CompTIA does really good. Um, you're now having to retest and retake that kind of stuff. I'm so old, I got grandfathered in, so my A plus certification never expires. But if you can get things like Security Plus, Network Plus, uh, any kind of cloud accreditation and stuff like that, those help huge amounts because uh, it basically says that it shows that not only were you going to school to learn how to do this, but you also put the time in to learn how to do a specific, you also learn, put in the time to learn a specific skill set that's relevant to this company's needs. So we touched on the importance of networking and subnetting and such. There, is there any Windows, Linux? Okay. Uh yeah, I would probably focus uh, a lot of your time within Linux, 100%. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So, and it's about money. Windows is just too expensive to run in the cloud. Uh, you know, everybody else out there, they're trying to get away from a SQL database. They're, I mean, case in point, they're trying, a lot of folks are trying to get away from an Oracle database because there's a license cost that comes with that. Um, and there's a license cost that gets attached to every single VM you spin up on AWS, Azure, Windows, Google, if it's running a Windows operating system. Because Microsoft's going to get their money for that one way or the other, and it's going to be a premium. And so at the, at the end of the day, when you have an IT budget of X and you have an unnecessary OS spend of Y, everybody's going to be like, why aren't we moving to Linux? Linux is free. Like Linux does, it doesn't cost me an extra nine cents per per vCPU to run Linux on any cloud provider out there. Uh, so I would focus a lot on Linux. I would focus a lot on uh, you know, possibly some open source tech. Uh, you know, uh, Redis is getting to be really big nowadays. Redis Labs, they have a you know, really good database there. Uh, MongoDBs starting to come out of the woodworks as well. I've seen a lot of that going on. Um, or, you know, uh, if, if and, but the, the kind of trade-off there, though, is that you can shoot for these newer style open source products to focus on, or you can become a SQL engineer, you can become an Oracle DBA, you can become a, a you know, a, a Windows network administrator, a Windows, uh, Windows domain administrator, stuff like that. And those are rock solid jobs as well. But those are usually few and far between. I mean, Oracle DBA, don't get me wrong. You could, if you, if you got an Oracle database, if you get an Oracle database degree and you get a certification around that, you could probably find a job in a week. Uh, Cause you know, everybody's running Oracle. Everybody's running SQL. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, for someone starting in the IT field, what job do you think would be a great starting point? Um, so I kind of touched on that earlier, Ramon. Uh, really and any kind of technical support i know that doesn't seem like the glorious job it is but if you make it the glorious job you want it to be that gives you the the opportunity to sit there and say how how fast can i fix this person's problem because i've seen this before because i've read about this because i know how to youtube and i know how to google these problems 
um, you know, you just basically want to make yourself indispensable and start working from there. What type of setup do you need from working at home? Okay, cool. Now, I like this question. Um, you don't need what I have. I'll tell you that much. Um, if you got, let's just say if you got 200 bucks lying around, you can get yourself a decent microphone. Uh, you can get yourself like a, a PreSonus um, audio box or something like that that hooks up USB. And it basically allows you to use one of these like fancy broadcast microphones with your PC and it hooks up USB. So you get this crystal clear kind of stuff. And then you get to do funny stuff like this. <laughs> but, um, you know, it allows you to kind of, really you just need a solid microphone, headset, and a webcam. Um, really the, the most popular webcam being used today, I believe is this a Logitech C90 something. I'll get you guys a parts list. I'll, I'll, ship, I'll, ship, I'll send that over to, uh, to Professor Garza, a parts list of what I think everybody should use if they're going to be working from home. Uh, what are some company links that help point you to jobs in Austin? Okay, great question, George. Uh, so um, back when I was getting hired in Austin, and I want to see if they're actually still a company today, but there was a company called Modus. And Modus did nothing but IT contracting. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll throw this into, let me see if this is still it. I don't even know if this is still them anymore. This might be a different company. I'll, I'll find out who it is, but essentially I, we hired a lot of people at HP to, to fill out the rest of the support team from IT contractors. And basically the way that that works is I send my resume to them and they shop me around to everybody. And nine times out of 10, that is a temporary job. Hey, we need you to do this job for six months, or we need you to do this job for a year and a half, something like that. But then uh, if there's any luck to this position, if you do a really, you know, if you do a bang up job, you really kill it. Uh, there's a very good chance that you can convert this temporary employee status to a full time to an FTE employment status as well. So if you can try and find yourself an IT recruiter, IT headhunter, something like that, and just ship them your resume. They'll start shopping you around. They'll find you a job. That's that's basically what their job is, is to make sure you're employed. Uh, how can you best avoid getting stuck to enter your mid-level help desk roles? Oof. Uh, work on projects, whether it be a personal project or whether it be something that you can ask your management for. Um, the way that I moved from L1, L2 support to technical account management at HP was I got the, and it was, it was because of one ticket. So I got one ticket in my inbox and I was working with that. And I worked with this customer to bring over a very large implementation from AWS to HP cloud. And what I did was I just made sure that every single question that they had got answered by me. And when they would end up coming in to support in off hours or something like that, they would say, Hey, make this ticket for William. I'll talk to him in the morning kind of thing. Um, I really kind of like, I, I put my best foot forward. I gave this kind of white glove support to every single person that came into chat, regardless of how much they were spending. And when it came time that there was an opening for a technical account management position, I basically pulled up all of my metrics in Salesforce and said, Hey, remember when I started back here in November and now it's November, 2013, there's 2,300 tickets I've closed. Pay me. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so Jason, that, that's a really hard question. I mean, you got to find different avenues to, you got to find different avenues to show your worth. Regretfully, that's just best. The best way to put it is if there's something out there, volunteer for it. Don't kill yourself in the process. Don't burn yourself out. But if you have, if you think that you can tackle a project or a task, um, go ahead and do it. And if I'm being perfectly frank, if the company you're working for doesn't recognize what they have in you as an employee, somebody else will. Um, one of the funniest things that I saw as of late, now that uh, companies are starting to open back up, people are starting to go back into the office, um, tech CTOs and folks like that will find out that Oracle is now requiring everybody to go back into the Austin office. So they start having their recruiters reach out to every single person at Oracle that's going to go to that office and say, hey, you want to keep working remote? 
here's some money. Come work for us. So you just got to find that opportunity. Uh, let's see. Putting the time to learn something takes time and it is vital. What you learn builds on top of another skill set that you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Besides CompTIA, do you recommend Google IT, IT support professional certification? Google's growing 100%. Um, I have uh, folks that I've worked with since 2012 that actually ended up at Google. Um, I, would, I would utilize, I would go with Google IT support. I would try and find a cloud accreditation from Google as well. Um, they are very work from home friendly. They are very remote friendly. And uh, if you live within a, you know, so many miles of an office, you know, they kind of make you go in, but at the same time, there are a lot of perks there. Um, if I'm being perfectly frank, when you have a company that gives you all of these amenities, you, you think of it as a good thing. You know, like, hey, I can go to my office and get breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Awesome. The reality of it, <laughs> the reality of it, and some people have kind of found this out a little bit in this ways, but they do that to keep you at that office longer. So if you could find yourself a remote position that pays well and that allows you to kind of grow and expand into that, um, go for it. You got to go into an office, go for it. It's just a matter of what you want to do. Um, so yeah, uh, any kind of certificate works, but I would definitely recommend uh, the big three. Uh, well, I guess big four, because Oracle's starting to make a really big splash in that field as well. So if you can get yourself an Oracle certification, uh, whether it be a foundations, a professional, or a uh, associate architect, same goes for AWS, Azure, and Google. Uh, any kind of cloud accreditation from either of those four uh, will get you in the door to a lot of places. What does the future of IT look like from your perspective? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's on the same trajectory that it has been for a while where everything's moving to the cloud. Um, a lot of folks and, and <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of older individuals in the IT industry are starting to phase out of the environment and a lot of newer blood starting to come in. And the newer blood looks at a lot, the newer, the newer IT folks look at a lot of cloud providers as a very viable product. And it's not, you know, we, you don't have to hold on to your server anymore. It's not your pet anymore. You know, you need infrastructure on demand. You're going to get infrastructure on demand from nine, 19 different cloud providers out there. You're not going to call up IBM. They're not going to drop ship you a server. That just takes too much time. Um, buying physical infrastructure now, you know, COVID made that more impossible than ever. Uh, all of the supply, all the logistical stuff, the supply chain problems that we have today have increased hardware costs through the roof uh essentially you know if if everything goes the way it should be going and everything continues to track it should be going everything's going to be moving to the cloud some way shape or form uh so i i really 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 think that um if you want a rock solid future in it uh you need to focus on a lot of cloud providers a lot of virtual solutions and things like that because it's just too expensive to run on-prem hardware today. You got to buy hardware. You got to buy tile space in a data center. You got to rack stack and cable it. You got to power it. You got to get internet to it. That's five expenses right there that are going to cost you a massive amount of money. Or, hey, by the way, I only need this box through the week. I'm going to buy it by the hour and then shut it down when I don't. You've turned a capital expense into an operating expense, and it just looks better on the books, and it costs you a whole lot less money in the red down the road. Uh, companies will invest time. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Garza. So that's, that's one of the things, you know, if, if you show up to a job interview with certifications on the books, uh, that just goes to show, hey, I have put the time in. I want to, like, this is the kind of job that I want, and you can show it by the accreditations that I've gotten. Uh, projects, help, uh, projects help students build network computers. Sure, they're not probably the other. How about Amazon cloud jobs in the Austin area? Amazon's huge up here. They built a sprawling office in the domain. Uh, they hired on something like, I think back in 2013, I got headhunted for Amazon and they were doing something to the tune of like hiring 15,000 to 25,000 people 
for this Austin office that they had. And it's just gotten bigger. Okay. Professor Garza's done point question. I was making a point that from the time to time a company can terminate a project and say it's done or the money runs out. Yes, so that that 100% happens. So back to the project management piece. Um, there is such a thing as a kill meeting. So, you know, something doesn't look right. Uh, this is over budget and taking away too long. There's going to be a kill meeting. And basically you're going to wrap up everything that you've done and say, here's what we've cobbled together. And you're either, I mean, the powers that be are either going to go back to the well, get you more money, get you more time, or they're going to say, nope, this is a failed project. Kill it. We're just going to go away. We're going to do things the way we have been doing it. hundred percent. How long should one get certified or how long should one be getting certified for any type of certification? How long should one be getting certified? Uh, George, I'm not sure I understand, but um, uh, most, most technical certifications are good for about two years. Um, they, every, everything usually has like around a two to three year shelf life as far as technical certifications are concerned. So if you go out and uh, get yourself an AWS cert, an Oracle cert, or whatever it may be, uh, do plan and do anticipate to retake that exam in about another two years as new features roll out and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, looks like we're at seven o'clock. I can, I can keep going. If y'all have more questions, I'm not, I don't, I'm not really strapped for time right now. I do know that this was scheduled for an hour. Um, Heather, what do you want to do here? Well, we can keep going if folks still have a whole bunch of questions. Otherwise, um, I want to respect everyone's time and everything. Um, well, so, yeah, it looks like though it looks like you've answered uh, the majority of the of the questions, and everyone. I tried. Is so appreciative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> of absolutely. Having your perspective, it's just it, you know this is a excellent perspective to have, um, especially for folks who are trying to get into uh, into the field. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I'm. I'm, I'm glad that I kind of get to share the hardships that kind of make it a little bit easier for everybody else. So, um, yeah, I mean, any, and the biggest takeaway here, folks, is that um, technical project management itself is a combination of having to be both a, you know, a, you know, a, a Sherpa as well as a technical individual. You got to keep everybody on track. You got to make sure everything stays down the, stays down the correct path. Um, and beyond that, I mean, I would recommend uh, any kind of cloud certifications, anything like that. Um, also, you know, anticipate to be retaking certifications every two years or so as new features come out. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad y'all had fun. I'm glad y'all showed up. I appreciate it. I, all the questions were great. Y'all, Mr. Garza, you sound like you, I mean, it looks like you have a great group of kids here. Um, if there's anything I could do for you guys ever again, just give me a shout. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, William. Um, and a reminder, everyone, uh, if you missed some of the, uh, um, uh, presentation, or if you want to watch it again, we are going to be putting this up on the uh, SCC Library uh, YouTube page, and I'll be sending a link to uh, Professor Garza as soon as we've got that video up for you. So um, when you do close out a Zoom, you will be prompted with a survey. I would really appreciate it if you filled it out for us. Um, if it doesn't pop up for you, you're going to get an email with the link in it because I am nothing if not persistent. <laughs> so thank you again, William, and thank you everyone for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much for having me. You all take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.